Galatians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 21. We're looking at the gospel of grace. And so we'll begin here in chapter 2 at verse uh, 1. And I'll read verses 1 and 2 and get into our study. The gospel of grace, Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, beginning with verses 1 and 2. Paul writes, Then after 14 years... I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Now we're continuing our study here. We need to remind ourselves of the purpose of the book of Galatians. That will help us as as we're looking at the verses before us this evening. Remember the purpose of Galatians is to combat Jewish religious legalism that has begun to enter into the church. The basic error is righteousness by works. The heart of every man, the heart of every man-made religious system would be righteousness by my own efforts. And the Judaizers had, had been causing the Galatians to trade in their freedom that they have in Jesus Christ through the grace of God for bondage to the law of Moses. And so in the case of Paul, uh, one of the ways that the false teachers were deceiving was, as I was sharing with you recently, they were discrediting the apostle. That's why he had given his testimony. That's why he had been sharing some things concerning how he had come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and he's continuing to share those things so that we might understand what the grace of God is. Now, when he says in verse 1, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, he'd already been establishing the fact that uh, his time with the apostles had been limited. When we looked at chapter 1, and, and remember with me verses 18 and 19, he had said, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. So he'd already established the fact that his time with the apostles was limited. He'd only spent a few days with Peter and had spent time with James, the brother of Jesus Christ. Now, I didn't mention this last time. I added it to my notes this time because I wanted to note something with you in verse 19 of chapter 1 when it speaks concerning James, the Lord's brother. Let me share with you briefly something about that. Matthew chapter 13, in the Gospel of Matthew, verses 55 and 56, we see that Matthew lists that Jesus Christ had physical brothers and sisters. In Matthew 13, verses 55 and 56, it says this, Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So the Bible makes it very clear that he had brothers and sisters. He had four brothers and more than one sister. And the brothers are even named James being one of them. In the uh, Gospel of John, in chapter 7, verses 3 through 5, John records, his brothers said to him, depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. And then John says, even his brothers did not believe in him. So the Bible makes it clear that Jesus Christ had brothers. They are named for us and they're mentioned more than once. Now, there are those who believe that Mary remained what has been called a perpetual virgin that she never bore any children of her own. They believe and teach that the brothers that are mentioned were only cousins, or that Joseph had children from another marriage. The fact is, the Bible doesn't teach that. This is a doctrine that has been invented by men. There's no biblical reason to believe that these are not the children of Joseph and Mary. But those who oppose the idea that Jesus had half-brothers and half-sisters do so, not from a reading of the Bible, but from a preconceived concept of the perpetual virginity of Mary, which itself is unbiblical. Because in Matthew chapter 1, verse 25, it speaks of Joseph having no union with Mary until she gave birth to a son, 
and he gave him the name Jesus. So Joseph had natural relations with his wife Mary. Mary bore several children to him. Four of those sons are mentioned for us in Matthew chapter 13, as well as one of those sons being mentioned for us here in the book of Galatians in chapter 1. And so this one who is referred to as James, and he is called the Lord's brother. He's not referred to as the Lord's cousin, and he's not spoken of as being one who was born to Joseph. Nowhere in Scripture is that ever indicated. What you have is a natural relationship a husband has with a wife who produced children, and one of those children was just mentioned to us, one by the name of James here in chapter 1. And so what we're looking at is we're looking at Paul really speaking concerning his, his credentials and his ministry. So we'll get back to that. Notice in verse 1, after an interval of 14 years, Paul returned to the city of Jerusalem. Now that would be after he had originally met Peter as well as James. And so by now, Paul is pointing out that he's been a preacher of the gospel for some 17 years at that time. So the reason for his visit to Jerusalem was to defend the gospel that he'd been preaching. Now, Acts chapter 15 speaks concerning something called the first council of the church. And, and when the church got together, they were dealing with issues related to legalism intruding into, into the, um, the gospel of grace. It says in Acts 15, 1 and 2, if you take notes, certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about that question. And so Paul was speaking concerning those things, and this is something that was part of the first council as they were dealing related to whether or not you have Gentiles circumcised and, and, and under the uh, ritual and ceremonial law. And so as that's going on, Paul is dealing with that, and that's one of the reasons why it speaks concerning him bringing Titus. Titus was a Gentile, and Titus could be a great example of the grace of God as, as Paul brought Titus, a Greek, and was able to present him to the people as somebody who fully knew God through the relationship he had with Jesus Christ. Now, he says in verse 2, I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. And so, Paul may have been reluctant to go. He doesn't want to get into arguments. He doesn't want to get into disputes. But by the Spirit of God, Paul was led to go. And, and so he went up by revelation, and he communicated. When it speaks concerning communicating to them the gospel, that word means to simply explain, to set forth words for their consideration. What he did is he said, this is what, what God has led me to do. I've come to speak to you, to share with you what God has given to me to preach in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, whenever you preach the gospel, you need to understand that it is God's Word. You're not giving something a human invention. When I stand up and communicate the gospel, I do not think that it's of natural origin. And Paul didn't either. Paul taught that it wasn't. It's of divine origin. This is a message that comes from heaven. And so when he went by revelation, it's because the Holy Spirit led him to go and do that. He may not have wanted to go. But the Holy Spirit leads him and says, you need to go and you need to communicate. You need to disclose to them what you're teaching, what the gospel really is. But notice in verse 2, he did so privately to those, he says, who were of reputation. When he says, I did that privately to those who were of reputation, he actually repeats that kind of thought four times. You see it in verse 2. You'll see this again in a moment in verse 6 and also in verse 9. And, and when he speaks of them being of reputation, this may very well have simply been a, a, a sarcasm towards those who are involved in in this legalism because they were telling Paul, uh, rather they were telling the Galatians that Paul was not a person of reputation and so this could be his response. Now, approaching them privately limits the amount of people involved. I was just sharing a moment ago uh, with somebody that um, church business sometimes, when there are issues that are related to doctrine and all, Many times it is wiser for the church to gather together and speak amongst themselves, the church speaking amongst itself, really, and resolving disputes than to have those arguments put on the air for all to read because very often those who don't know Christ are looking for an excuse not to believe in Him. And those who don't believe in the Word of God very often are looking for reasons to say that it's not of divine origin. 
And then you have people arguing in front of those who don't know the Lord, and it gives those who don't know the Lord the opportunity to point a finger at those who do and say, you guys don't even know what you actually believe in, and you can't even agree on certain things. And so sometimes it's wiser, if there's a dispute of any sort related to theology, to not argue in front of the world, but to do it privately, so that those who are involved in the argument can have an opportunity to speak, to be heard, and to receive correction where it's necessary. And so that's what Paul does. Paul limits the amount of people involved in order that they can deal with it, in order that they can resolve this. Now notice in verse 2 how he says, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. I'm concerned that this error may have crept into the leadership of the church. And I'm concerned that they might have been uh, corrupted by it. So if the church has been turned, then all of my efforts to preach the gospel would be futile. Now he goes on in verse 3 to say, Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. But this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth, to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. And so he speaks of Titus being a Greek. Titus wasn't circumcised, and his life in Christ is evidence that grace is sufficient. Notice verse 4, though, how he says, but this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in. They were brought in in order to spy out liberty. Notice he calls them false brethren. Uh, when he speaks of them as being false brethren, th that's another way of saying they were simply phony Christians. They were shams. And they came in secretly because they wanted to undermine the work of grace. They had secretly and deceptively infiltrated with the purpose of destroying Many years ago, I was told that when Billy Graham, this, this was many years ago, was giving his uh, crusades, as, as all of us are familiar with crusade evangelism, he would give his invitation. And um, there were cult members who were infiltrating the follow-up ministry so that when new believers would come in who had just freshly said, I want to follow Christ, the cult members who had gone through the training but never truly identified uh, their, their beliefs to those who were interviewing them and training them were beginning to draw people away to bring them into their false doctrines. That does happen. One of my friends, a Calvary pastor, many years ago had the same thing happen in his church where they began to try to infiltrate, try to come into the follow-up ministry in order to, when a young person would, or a, a new believer would come in, in order that they might deceive them and bring them into their unbelief system. And that's what's taking place here. There are false brethren who are secretly infiltrating the church, and as they do so, they're the kind who will have a conversation with you, and as they're conversing, they'll speak to you concerning what you were taught, and then they'll say, you know, that's an interesting thing that he said, but have you ever thought of it this way? And then they bring in their doctrine and they undermine what is taking place by injecting their false beliefs. Paul said that was taking place there in the churches of Galatia where the Judaizers who were caught up with trying to bring believers, Gentiles, into Jewish law, they were coming in secretly in order that they might influence so they could turn us away from the gospel of grace and bring people into the bondage of the law and say they were secretly and they were deceptively infiltrating in order to bring people into legalism. When the apostle Peter is writing in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, he says, There were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. It normally is secret. It's normally not an upfront attack. It's normally done in, in conversation. It's normally done through uh, leaving literature. We have had people 
who have come onto our parking lot here in this church who have actually gone on the parking lot and they have left their brochures on the windshields. And we have our, our security outside who have collected all of those things before you go out to your cars. And we have a circular file that we usually file them in called a trash can. We have gone out after church services in this, in this hall and in everyone that we've had, and we have found um, little, um, you know, tracks that are filled with error, that people who have come into church here, sat in a Bible study, will leave it on the pew, hoping that one of you will pick it up and read it and be persuaded to pursue them. They'll put their phone number down, tell you where, you know, you can meet with them and all of that. So we've had that happen more than once here in the history of this church. They do that. You may not believe that, but it's true. They do that. They will come in. I have had people after Bible study want to argue with me about their doctrine. I had one guy who came in to argue with me after a Bible study, and he tried to lead me to the Lord. He, he, he was certain that I was unsaved. And I told Raul, look at man, I've known Jesus for a long time. Why are you doing that? But that actually happens, and, and it happens quite often. And, and so that began very early in the church where, where people would come in and they would bring their little slant, their little twist, and they would take you away from the grace of God. And that's what Paul is speaking about. But notice how he speaks in verse 5. He says, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth will continue. We didn't submit in the least to these false teachers. We wanted the truth to continue being presented. Now, in verse 5, rather verse 6, but from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows, no, God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me. They gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Now, again, his favorite description of the false brethren, those who seem to be something. It may be that he's addressing their mentality of superiority. It's one of the things that you'll see. Listen, one of the things that is very important in a genuine Christian life is humility. It's humility. It's, it's one of the chief graces, if you will. It's one of those wonderful virtues, the, the most humble individual, of course, who ever lived on the face of the earth was Jesus Christ, who described himself as being meek and lowly. Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, would describe himself as being meek, I am lowly. Humility is, is one of the virtues that demonstrates that you actually have a relationship with God. It was through pride that Satan was kicked out of heaven. It was because he was proudful, because he wanted to be like the Most High. And it's a chief sin. Pride is a chief sin. That's why God said he, give, he gives grace to the humble, but he opposes the proud. Because pride is that which got Satan kicked out of heaven, and it's that which turns people off. But when you have a, a, a heart of humility, when, when you know who you are, and, and one of the ways, the easiest way to get to know who you are is just to get to know who Jesus is. If you spend time in the Word and you begin to look at Jesus, do this. This, this is easy. Read 1 Corinthians 13. Just read it and, and read the description of what love is. That's all you need to do. And when it says love is patient, love is kind, when you begin to do that, all you need to do, this will help you see, is, is put the name Jesus there. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. And go through the descriptions found, especially in verses 4 through 8, about what love is. And you'll see that Jesus Christ perfectly fits in the description. He is patient. He is kind. He is all those things. And then all you need to do is put your name there. David is patient. Nah. David is kind sometimes. You know, I mean, that's all you really need. to. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. The Bible is described as a mirror by James. It's a mirror. He says, a man who looks into that mirror, uh, into the law of God, is like a man and, and doesn't see himself. And it is like a man who looks in the mirror and turns away and promptly forgets what manner of man he is. It's kind of like in the morning when you're about to go out, whether it's to work or school or whatever it is, 
I don't know if you do this, many do, I do this. You spend some time doing whatever it is, trying to get yourself in some kind of condition that you don't scare the neighbors. And, 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 and you look at yourself in the mirror, right? And then you turn around and you start to walk away. Do you ever return and look one last time? Do you ever do that, you know? Or when you arrive at your location, do you ever pull down the rear view mirror? and just make sure that you're okay. I, that happens all the time. I, I see people do that all the time. Ladies seem to do that when they're driving. It's just an amazing thing. Why do you do that? It's because you forget what you looked like, even five minutes later. Now, James says that we can look into the Word of God and forget what it reveals to us within a short time. So one of the best things you can do is stay in the Word. When you stay in the Word of God and you see Jesus revealed to you, when you start seeing who He is, listen, it's, it's not that hard. When you start doing that, you start seeing yourself for who you are. Humility is simply seeing yourself in the light of Jesus Christ. That's all it really is. It's just taking time to see Him. And when you see Him and the way He acts and the way He was and the way He is now, when you see him picking up the children and loving them, when you see him gently being a loving, kind friend to men like John, I learned so many lessons. And I've told you this before, but, you know, I, I was raised in, a, in, a, in, in, a, in the way men are raised. I don't know another way to say that. My dad came out of the Depression era. His dad didn't show him any physical affection. My dad was not a physically affectionate man as I grew up, like probably everybody's dad in here, I'd suppose. It just wasn't my dad. My, if my dad wanted to tell me he loved me, my dad would grab me by the head and, and rub my head. That was, that was it. That was affection. I mean, I'd be walking by and he'd say, David, and I'd turn around, come here. And I'd walk up to him and he'd grab my head and rub it. And that was like, he's saying, I love you. My dad didn't say I love you till I was 17. I hadn't even heard my dad ever say that. You know, that was not my dad. When I was four years old, I would kiss my dad goodnight. When I turned four, my dad said to me, men don't kiss, men shake hands. So there was no physical affection from the time I was four. And so as I grew up, the way I was is I figured, you know what, men don't cry, men don't show emotion. The only emotion you really can show that's legitimate may be anger. If you've been drinking for a while, you've got an excuse, and so you can tell your girlfriend, I love you, man. I really love you. You know, if you're nice and drunk, you can say, I love you. But at the same time, but if you ever go out on me, I'll kill you. I mean, you've got that weirdness going on. So you really don't know how to communicate. You don't know how to say, I love you. So guys, we don't know how to do that. Men are not like women. Women will cry over anything with other women, even strangers. Women will go into bathrooms and with their best friend in the next place next to her, they'll talk, hey, in a bathroom. Men, you go in a bathroom, you don't talk to other men in the bathroom. You don't even look at them. It's like you're the only guy in the bathroom. You wash your hands and you get out. That's it, you never talk. Even to your best friends, you never talk. You just don't. Men don't do that. Women are different. So women cry over things that they're happy about. Men don't even cry. When they do cry, they need an excuse. And that's just the way I was. That's, that's how I was till I read the Bible. Jesus cried over his friend Lazarus who died. Jesus cried over a city that rejected him. And I read these things. Jesus picked up babies and held them. Jesus had a friend named John. And John would put his head on Jesus' chest and lay there next. And I thought, are you kidding me? What man lays like that on another man? Are you, you got to be kidding me. What's that all about? I mean, I couldn't even hold hands in prayer with other men. I couldn't do it. When we first got saved, they said, you got to pray. And we would, we would sit down on the, in the front room, and, and we'd sit in a prayer circle, and, and you'd hold hands. Now, if it was a girl, that was cool. If it was a guy, I'd squeeze his hand for 20 minutes. Man, He's not going to get a weird thought about this guy here. I'm not going to hold him. We'd even wrestle for who's going to be having the dominant. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I know you do. 
I know you do. You know, in sports, you know, you hit a guy in the rear end when he goes by only in sports. You don't do it any other time. You don't do that. So, how do you change? Well, one, you need to want to. You need to want to be more like him. That's one way, right? You have to have the want to. But two, you need to have the model. I had a friend named George. George used to hug me. And, and it was kind of like weird. Because he'd, he's brother, you know, he'd hold me. And, and, and at first, I, I, I like, I don't know what to do. I just, <laughs> but something inside of me said, he loves you. And, 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 and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with this guy grabbing you. As long as it's within, let's go, within a second or two, it's cool. Better not hold on too long, we're going to have problems. <laughs> but he was a mentor. So one, I, I wanted to love. And two, I wanted to learn how to do it properly. So God gives you people in your life who help you to learn to do the right thing by their example. But three, and most especially, I simply spent time reading the Bible. And I looked at Jesus, and I saw that he was filled of, with mercy, and I saw that he was filled with humility, and I saw that he was filled with grace, I saw that he was filled with goodness, I saw that he was kind, I, I saw that he was loving, I saw that he was compassionate, I saw that he was merciful. I saw that he didn't like self-righteousness, but he was attracted to humility. I, 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 I actually saw how he treated women that society didn't treat well, like a woman at Samaria or a woman who was a sinner in the city. And I started seeing how, how the Lord Jesus Christ, and it all comes from the Bible. And so God's grace transforms people's lives. And, and God's word and his truth helps us to see who he really is. And, and when the false teachers would enter in and would bring in their false doctrine, it was undermining the gospel of grace. It was, it was, it was causing the people to, to, to become rigid and, and legalistic and, and to lose the joy and, 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 and all the, the goodness of, of, of being a sinner who's been saved by grace. And, and so, so what happened is, instead of them having this evidence of humility, they had an air of superiority. And they walked around like we were people who know, we know more than you. And they, that arrogance that is so unattractive to God, well, they seem to be something, Paul said. Because you know what? It's human nature to begin to think if somebody walks around like he's special, he must be. And then sometimes they treat him as if they are special. Even before my dad came to Christ, my dad taught me lessons. One of the things my dad said to me is, um, he, he said this maybe a couple times that I can remember in my lifetime, but it stuck with me. My dad said, I'm not impressed with men. I'm just not. He said, that guy, he said, he gets up in the morning like I do. And my dad said it like this. He said, he puts his pants on one leg at a time, just like I do. And that's how my dad was. He was not impressed with men. So I'm that way too. It doesn't matter what other people think about this person. I'm not really impressed. You know what impresses people like me? Humility, love, grace, a knowledge of Jesus, compassion, mercy. Those things are very attractive to me. And when I have friends like that or know people like that, I'm very impressed with them because God has worked in them. And that's what I believe I want to be like, like Jesus Christ. Anybody can walk around with their, their head up in the air like they're very special and very important and can demand for people to treat them that way because they really think they are. There's only one person in this universe that's important. That's Jesus Christ. The rest of us are in need of him, and that's how it works. And so Paul said these people think there's something special. They walk around as if they are. These people seem to be something. He said, but it makes no difference to me. 
It makes no difference. Why? Well, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Notice in verse 6, he says, God shows personal favoritism to no man. Romans 2.11 makes it clear, There is no respect of persons with God. So he says, Those who seem to be something added nothing to me. They didn't contribute to my knowledge of the gospel. On the contrary, verse 7, they saw that the gospel to the, uh, to the uncircumcised has been given to me. Paul, in other words, and the apostle Peter had specific ministries. Paul knew that God had called him to take the message of the gospel to the Gentiles, and that's what he did. But the apostle Peter had a ministry to the circumcised. He, in other words, would minister to the Jewish nation. And so he said, I have received a commission to take this message to the Gentiles. But on the other hand, we have the Apostle Peter who takes this message to the, uh, to the Jew. So he's saying, as I was speaking to these people who were, who were uh, serving the Lord prior to me, instead of correcting me, they blessed me. So the men of genuine recognition recognized and encouraged my ministry. But, verse 10, they desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. I've mentioned this to you before. When you look in um, the Sermon on the Mount, when the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking, he speaks concerning the practices of a religious person during the first century. And if you were to look at somebody and that was a religious person in the Jewish faith, this was a person who gave gifts, this was a person who prayed, and this was a person who fasted. Those were the three earmarks of a religious person. A religious person during the time of Christ would pray, would fast, and would give their alms. Jesus spoke of those things, but he said some people do those things to be seen by men. And that's why Jesus said when they do those things that are, that are proper things to do, right things to do, praying and fasting and being generous, those are all good things, but when they do that to be seen by men, they receive from men their reward by the attention that men give them for being that way. Now, one of the things, therefore, that a genuine believer would do would be he would be or she would be generous to those who had genuine needs. And so in verse 10, when it says, they desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I was also eager to do, he's simply saying that as an earmark or a genuine uh, demonstration that I have a relationship with God, make sure that you care for the practical needs of people. In other words, don't be the kind of person who simply says, uh, God bless you, be warmed and filled, and walk away when you could have helped them, but instead of helping them, they had a genuine need. You simply give them a, a pious phrase and say, I'll pray for you. Because in reality, the church was known for its generosity, especially for those who have need in the brother or sisterhood of Christ. In 1 John 3, 17, it says, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? And so he said, I desire to be generous because that's an earmark of somebody who really loves. Now in verse 11, but when... When Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Peter acted the role of hypocrite. This is an interesting thing. I want you to notice that the Apostle Peter, who was one of the original 12, somebody who was an outspoken leader, as a matter of fact, every time you see the list of the 12 apostles, you'll find something consistent. You'll see the Apostle Peter is always the first one mentioned, and Judas is always the last one. There's a mix, you know, mix, mixing of the names of the other apostles in between, the other ten. But the apostle Peter is always the first one named. The apostle Peter was somebody that the Lord Jesus Christ looked at and said, 
Your name is going to be Rock. The confession of faith that you have given is what I will build my church upon. You who crumble easily, you who waver back and forth, will one day have a strength that's going to come through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what's going to happen to you. The Apostle Peter was somebody that early in the history of the church was used by the Lord Jesus Christ with the keys to the kingdom in that he had preached the message on Pentecost when 3,000 came and into a faith relationship with God. It was the Apostle Peter who also preached the Samaritans. He was an individual who was used in a variety of ways to use those keys to open the doors of the kingdom to various people groups. People groups, And so the Apostle Peter was well used by the Lord. Well, he was in, in Joppa. And while he was there, he went on to a rooftop at noon. And he was praying, an hour of prayer, and he was praying. And he had a vision. He saw a sheet with many animals on it lowered from heaven. Then he heard a voice from heaven that said, Rise up, Peter, slay and eat. And he began to argue with the voice of the Lord who was speaking to him, Not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything unclean because on this sheet were all kinds of unclean or non-kosher animals. And this is a kosher Jew, and he's saying, No way am I going to do that. I've never allowed myself to eat something that is regarded as unclean. And the Lord said, That which I have pronounced to be clean, you are not to call unclean. Well, at that time, these representatives of a Gentile were knocking on the door there. And they were saying that a man by the name of Cornelius was asking the Apostle Peter to come and to see him. So the Apostle Peter, knowing this is the Lord, goes with these Gentiles into the home of a Gentile, a man by the name of Simon the Tanner. And now, while he is there, he basically is, he says, God has shown me that what he has called clean, I am not to refer to as being unclean. And when he says, God has shown me that, it's in a sense, in a tense that God has opened my eyes. I completely understand this, that there is no separation in, in the body of Christ between a Jew and a Gentile. And he's saying that I understand that God is not a respecter of persons, that God is saving Gentiles along with the Jews, which was a real, real amazing thing. So he knew that. And yet, I want you to see what's taking place here. Verse 11, when Peter came to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of, of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. The apostle Peter was a stumbling block to those who at one time were strong, believing and knowing that God had opened the door to Gentiles. Before, he had regularly eaten with Gentiles, but these false Christians arrived. And when they arrived, they, they acted as, as if James had sent them, and they were now introducing their legalism. And so Peter actually joined their group, and he began to separate from the Gentiles. Even as I mentioned, normally he would eat as a regular practice with Gentiles because they were family. But now he's withdrawing from them, and that, Paul says, is the sin of hypocrisy, and his hypocrisy affected other believers. Notice other Jews, including Barnabas, who was a leader in the fellowship, were drawn away. That gives to us a great example of the influence and authority of the Apostle Peter and his personal impact on people. Never forget, by the way, that you have that kind of impact on some people too. I do, and you do too. You have friends who look up to you. Friends who know you've walked with the Lord for a while. They look up to you. And, and as they look up to you, you model Christianity, especially new believers. You model that. I told you the truth. The truth, when I first got saved, my friend Bill had started going to uh, Calvary Chapel and had claimed a profession of faith in July, July 29th, 1970. I got saved in December of, of 1970. And so he had made a profession of faith five months before I had. To me, he was equivalent to an elder in the body of Christ. 
because he was five months old in the Lord. I can still remember being at a Bible study when one of the girls said, today is my spiritual birthday. And we said, really? How old are you? And she said, I'm a year old today. I remember looking at her going and saying to her, wow, a year. Man, are you mature. I thought a year old Christian was like Billy Graham. I mean, this is, this is a theologian. You know, they can pronounce the books of the Bible. I was still learning how to say Ecclesiastes. You know, and this person knows where it is. They know where those books are. Amazing, they're so deep. And that's kind of how it works. So you may be thinking of yourself as really nothing. That's not true. You have people around you who have not been walking with Christ as long as you, and they watch you. Now, that's not a, a, it's not easy all the time. I'll be honest with you. Sometimes it can be a bit of a pressure to realize that, but it is true. You never know. You never know who goes to your church with you. You never know that. I have been in San Luis Obispo. Marie and I get up early, and we go to a little, a little um, coffee shop where we can buy some coffee and some cookies. And we go, that's 250 miles away. It's 7.30 in the morning. The shop has just opened. It's a Saturday. We go walking up. I, I'm about to open the door when somebody's coming out. They open the door up, and they look at me, and they say, Hi, Pastor David. I see that you enjoy this, this shop, too. I'm 250 miles away from here, and they're saying, Hi, Pastor David. I have been on airplanes with stewardesses who have heard my voice, who will walk up and say to me, Are you David Rosales? And I'll say, Who wants to know? And I'll say, Yeah. <laughs> yes, I am. Well, you know what? I listen to you on K-Wave. I was sharing not long ago that, uh, you know, a few years ago now, Marie and I were taking a flight, and and we were seated in the waiting room there in Ontario, and, and uh, I'm noticing that there's nobody there at the gate, and I'm wondering what's going on, and I'm supposed to be in a certain place at a certain time to teach. So I go up to the, uh, the counter, and I speak to the person behind the counter, and they say, oh, your flight was canceled. And I say, really, it wasn't posted. We didn't even know. No, your flight has been canceled. And I said, what are we supposed to do? Well, you'll have to go downstairs and you have to speak to somebody there at one of these desks. So I'm walking down and I'm getting stressed. I'm thinking, man, I got to be in this, this other state doing something tonight. And so, you know, this lady says, you're going to have to fly out of Los Angeles. But my, my, the, the, the guy who dropped me off has already left. What time are we supposed to be there? In two and a half hours. And it's just a lot of stress. But I have to go and I have to process through there in Ontario. So I'm standing with Marie in line. And I am not a happy camper. I am not happy. And I'm just, I, when I get upset, I, I get quiet. So I'm just standing there very quietly, and I breathe hard. <sighs> and Marie knows that. She can see, oh, man, I can't believe it. Oh, man. I, how what am I going to do? Oh, man, I'm so... So I'm standing in line. And so I get to the, after several people, I get to the front desk, and I'm standing there like this, and the lady says to me, um, what flight were you on? And I said, we were on this flight. Where are you going to? We're going to this city. Oh, you're going to have to fly out of Los Angeles. I said, yes, I know. Do you have any ID? I said, yes. And I hand her my, my license, and she looks at me, and she says, David Rosales? I said, yeah. She goes, I listen to you on K-Wave. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. That's great. <laughs> Good. You know, God said, you hypocrite. You were just breathing, and you're so upset. And here you go, oh, praise God, Jesus, you're so good. Come on, man. But you never know. You, you know this is true. You never know who is seated next to you. You never know who is, is, is shopping. I went to buy something for Marie for, for Christmas today, and, and as I'm there in, in, in the store you know, with my daughter, because my daughter has to tell me, that's okay, Mom will, Mom will like that. And a, a lady walks up. To, I, I actually walk by, and she smiles, you know, and, and, I'm, and, I, and there's... You know, I, I think, I, I wonder if, if I know her. Um, but I'm not one of these people who will turn and look at you a second time. I just don't because I don't want you to get the right, wrong idea, you know, like, hey, baby, I don't want you to think that, you know. <laughs> so I'll just kind of look down, you know. 
But she walks up about five minutes later and she says, Pastor, I just want to say hi. I go to your church, you know. You never, you never, ever know. You do have a witness you may not even be aware of. You do. There are people in this church who see you and when you may not even see them. And, and I am telling you that is an absolute true thing. The Apostle Peter had a reputation and an influence. And when he began to act as a hypocrite, his influence was so great that even Barnabas, Barnabas was the son of encouragement who when Paul got saved, brought Paul under his wing in order to disciple him into how Christians act. Not necessarily teaching him the theology so much as putting an arm of Christian brotherhood around him and accepting him and actually using his influence to help Paul to be accepted by the brethren who were afraid of him because of what he had recently been doing. And so even Barnabas is being carried away with the hypocrisy. So what does the Apostle Paul do? He confronts him. It says in verse 14, When I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. So Paul confronts the apostle Peter and says, listen, you're acting the role of a hypocrite. And he did it in front of witnesses. He said they weren't being straightforward. In other words, they weren't walking a straight path. They were not walking uprightly. So notice how he says, I said to Peter before them all, this was an open sin. Well known, therefore, it required an open confrontation. It is not advantageous to correct in secret an error that occurs publicly. And so he says in verse 14, if you're a Jew and you live in the manner of Gentiles, why are you compelling? In other words, you are undermining the grace of God. Now, not only is Paul using this as an example to bolster grace, but he is also using this as an example to establish his own authority. Now he says in verse 15, we who are Jews by nature, not sinners of the Gentiles. In other words, sinners of the Gentiles meant that they didn't have the law as their standard. He's saying, we who are Jews by nature have a tremendous advantage in that God has given to us that which he didn't give to Gentiles. Well, we, according to verse 16, know that a man isn't justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus. In other words, no amount of obeying law makes a man righteous. Righteousness is a matter of the heart. It's a matter of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, boiling it down to basics, the legalists are saying you need to do these things to be right before God. Paul is saying you need to, need to believe this man to be right before God. You need to believe Jesus to be right before God because Jesus will transform you from the inside. Practical application. Before I was a Christian, I might have a girlfriend. I might be faithful to her. I might not. Just depends on my mood. And any opportunities that may be given to me to be unfaithful. I get married. Opportunities have been given to me to be unfaithful, but I've never been unfaithful. Why is that? Because before I knew the Lord and before I was married, I didn't really have a love for the people I was with. And I didn't have a faith in Christ that taught me what love is. And so it, by my nature, I do what pleases me. And, and that means it doesn't matter if she never finds out. What she doesn't know is not going to hurt her. And that was my mentality. But I get saved. 
And after getting saved, God introduces me to a girl named Marie who becomes my wife. And so, though opportunity is given, it's never been acted upon. Why? Because love for that woman forbids that I should do anything to break her heart. It isn't because she'd kill me, which she would, but it has nothing to do with that. It's not because, oh, I'm afraid she's going to find out or what. It's never been anything like that. I, I, I don't think anything like that. It's always been because love demands loyalty, because love demands faithfulness, because love demands that, because that's what love is. And so because I have a love for this woman, my behavior will demonstrate that through faithfulness. Well, you know what? When you fall in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not a matter of, oh, he's not going to like this and, oh, he does like that. I mean, that helps. You read the Word of God and you say, oh, so this pleases you. Well, I want to please you. But what is the motivation for pleasing him? So that I can get saved? So that I hold fast to these things and I'm going to make it in through the skin of my teeth? No, I do these things because of a love for God. And that's what God said when, when Jesus was asked, what is the great command in the law? Jesus didn't say, you need to do this or do that. He, what did he say? He said, love the Lord your God with everything that is within you. You want to know what the great commandment is? It's love. Love God with everything that is within you and love your neighbor as yourself. In this, the whole law and prophet hangs on this commandment that has, a, that has an application. If you love God, whom you haven't seen, then you're really going to love people whom you have seen. And that's why John would say, a person who says he loves God whom he has never seen and yet hates his brother who, is he, who he has seen is a liar because how can you love God whom you haven't seen and hate your brother whom you do see? And so Christianity has always been love. It's God's love for us and it's our love for him. A legalist will come in and say, oh, no, no. Make sure you cut your hair in a certain way. Make sure that you wear certain kinds of clothes. Make sure that you sing certain kinds of songs. Make sure you do certain kinds of things, and, and, and then you're really Christian. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. He said, greater love has no man than this, and a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I've commanded you. And so what is he saying? He's saying that everything is wrapped up in what is called the royal law. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the legalists will come in and get you to doing all kinds of things. And not only that, but the fruit of it is going to be that you begin to judge others who don't do exactly what you do. And now you judge them because, oh, you know, how long did you pray today, brother? I prayed for 25 minutes. Well, you know, one of these days you'll pray as long as I do because I prayed for 35 minutes. And that's what they do. How many chapters did you read? Well, you know, I, I really didn't get into my devotion. You didn't get into your devotions. How do you survive without your devotions? You know, I got up early this morning, was laying in a porcelain bathtub. And I was reading, I read the entire Bible this morning. Now, what's wrong with you? I mean, people do that. I've had that laid on me. I've had that laid on me. You know, you read the Word of God because you want to talk to God. You pray because you enjoy your conversations and you want God to speak back to you when you read His Word. So, the best relationships I know are the kinds that, that are constant communication. That's why you pray so much. You know, when I took Marie out on our first date, I picked her up at 11. I went home at 1 in the morning. I picked her up at 11 in the morning and went home at 1 in the morning. We were together for all that time, and we talked constantly and have never stopped. She and I hit it off so well. The very first date, we have done nothing but talk. We wouldn't even play the radio. You know, we, would, we, didn't, play, we didn't play the radio. We'd just drive and talk. We've always done that to this day. We still do that. We always are constantly just talking. I enjoy talking to the person I'm in love with. Prayer is the same way. Oh, you know, I better pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Oh, no, 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 no. No, I don't talk like that to anybody else. You know, I speak to the Lord of my heart. Jesus, you know what's going on right now? I'm standing in line, and I'm not happy. And you're going to have to help me. And I actually talk my heart to the Lord. He knows it. He knows all things. He already read my heart long before I disclose. He knows my thoughts before I think them, the words before they're formed on my tongue. He knows it all together. And so how can I hide from him and pretend he doesn't know these things? I learned that a long time ago. So you be open with him and you talk to him. It's love. And legalism will keep you from Jesus Christ. It, legalism will keep you from loving people. And you know, one of the things I thank God for with my own pastor, Pastor Chuck, 
was he did not condemn us when we were hippie kids sitting in his church barefooted with long hair sticking our big toes in the communion cup holders he did not kick us out of the church and for that I will always be grateful a couple of things and then we're going to have communion a man is not justified he says by the works of the law justification what is it? Well, justification is to declare the, righteous, the rightness of something or someone. Justification is a legal term. It's the act of God whereby he declares righteous the one who believes in Jesus Christ. Justification stresses forgiveness. It's really a subtraction of sin. It is that someone becomes just or right before God in Jesus. It's more than forgiveness of sins because it's the removal of guilt and the removal of condemnation. It's not only the removal of guilt and con condemnation, it is the giving of and receiving of, of righteousness. We are justified as a matter of grace through faith. In Romans 3.24, it says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 3.28 says, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the works of the law. Peter's actions had actually given credence to the false gospel of the Judaizers. Because if Judaizers are correct in their doctrine, then all who have fellowship with Gentiles are actually sinners because they're ignoring Jewish ritual law. That's why Paul in verse 18 says, For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. He's simply saying, I'm not rebuilding a system of legalism that destroys the gospel of grace. And finally, he says, in verse 19, For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, Christ died in vain. I am completely set free in Jesus Christ. I will never return to the law because the law will never set a person free. He's saying, I live by faith in Jesus. And Jesus said, if you know me, I will make you free and you will be free indeed. And that doesn't come to saying lots of prayers and doing lots of good works. That freedom comes through trusting in Jesus, falling in love with him, and just living as if you do love him.